just refer to the So these are some of the cells. See, this isn't sexy. It's not glamorous. These are steel, rusty cells. Just the shot glass, one watt hour, hot and fuck, and then 200 watt hour. And, uh, so this is one of the cutaways. So this is magnesium on top, salt here, and uh, animal on the bottom. This is uh, one of my students, Jocelyn. She's from Oregon. That's Steve Chu, who was the uh, Secretary of Energy. That was June of 2012. This is Sal. He's from California. He's the son of uh, migrant farm workers. Went to community college. And then somebody in community college said to him, you know, you can probably make it in university. He ends up at Berkeley, first of his class in physics, ends up at MIT. David Bradwell brings him to me. We put him on a project, and then he gets his PhD there. Um, this is me and Steve Chu. Steve Chu autographed the glove box, and I made sure we wore glasses. I <laughs> <laughs> use this picture now. <laughs> so we've tested over 1,000 cells, different alloys, and a number of them below $100 a kilowatt hour. And it's not just cook and look. I, I reject the Edisonian notion. Edisonian means you don't know what you're doing. You just grab every element you could to try to figure out what the light bulb filament should be. And you know, I don't care about publishing. It tended means never having to say you're sorry. So I don't, I don't care about publishing. <coughs> uh, I want to launch the careers of the young people working with me. And so this past fall, we got this paper into nature, not nature communications, not nature chemistry, not nature materials, nature. <laughs> and then they, they work really hard, and we got through because it's tough. And they try to get published in nature. He's beat up so bad. Anyways, yeah. So, and, and they wanted an image, and Felice Franklin. I'll make this image for us. Obviously, you can't do this for a cell operating at 500 degrees Celsius, so we made a room temperature analog. So you can see at the top, it's a square walled uh, Pyrex cuvette. This is probably about uh, four inches by one inch. And this is liquid mercury on the bottom. You can see the meniscus like this. And then for the electrolyte, we used an aqueous solution of sodium chloride and water. And then this is the current collector for the negative electrode, it's a ferro-nickel foam. And you can see the meniscus on the electrode. It's just a really nice image. I just like it. They did. They didn't do that. They yeah. something. I'll, I'll show you what they put on that. Anyway, so, but now, this is the other thing that's really cool, is the stun of the no fade rate. So, so this is a cell that's been operating for um, quite some time, 600 milliamps per square centimeter. It's about 50 times the current density of a, of a lithium ion battery, and 100% depth of discharge. So that's the biggest stress test you can get. Full charge, full discharge, full charge, full discharge. And uh, fade rate is 0.002% per cycle. So what does that mean? It means uh, 10 years of daily cycling, that's 3,650 daily cycles. It retains 99.4% of its energy. There's no battery. The normal metric is 80%. How long does it take before the battery has lost 20% of its capacity? This would be 305 years. That ought to take care of pretty much everybody in this room. <laughs> so then we started a company, I, David, and one of my other uh, proteges. And all the sexy names were taken. This was 2010. So we had to register something, so we called it the Liquid Metal Battery Corporation. You can't get a more boring name than that. When, when I first announced that I was working on batteries in the mid-90s, people looked at me funny and said, batteries in the 19th century? And of course, we're all tethered in the wireless age. You go to an airport, everybody's looking for power. And uh, yeah, so if you say your, your company is the Liquid Metal Battery Corporation, you just see people walk around and party. So we renamed it Ambry uh, two years ago. I wanted to get a, a catchy name. So Ambry.com was still available, five letter domain name that's pronounceable. And uh, 
I met her from Cambridge, so uh, Amory came from the part of Cambridge. So it has nothing to do with the village in the Italian part of Switzerland. It has a very good hockey team. Um, so our, our Series A funding came from Bill Gates, not from Canada. I'm very polite. I, I wouldn't dare approach Bill Gates. He came to me. It's a really cool story. So I was teaching this big freshman chemistry classes, as you heard. And we got so big that they had to record it, post it on the internet. And uh, turns out, Bill Gates started watching my lectures online for the open coursework. So, and he watched them all. And one year, I got a, I got an email from somebody saying uh, I'm at the annual Microsoft retreat. And Bill has just called you up, saying that he's watched all your lectures. You should be very proud. I looked at him and said, yes. And uh, <laughs> so then it's uh, August of 2009. I get a, an email from a woman who says she's his secretary. And says that he's coming to Boston in late September. He'd like to meet me. But I have some time. Well, I ignored the email because <laughs> I thought it was one of you. <laughs> so then uh, she wrote again, said, perhaps you didn't see the email. <laughs> Mr. Gates would really like to see you. I said, maybe this is real. So he came, we sat in my office in the second floor, building eight for about 90 minutes. We talked about distance learning and about open courseware engineering education and all that kind of stuff. We started talking about uh, storage, and he says, it seems to me uh, the approach to stationary storage ought to be intrinsically different than the approach to portables. I said, you're one of people understand. I got colleagues down the hall that are going to read my lithium mining batteries for stationary. And uh, so I, I showed him these this idea, I just sketched it on the board. We had no, this was 2009, we had no results. This is before the RPP funding, and the early stuff that Dave and I did was awful. We couldn't make it work. It was just a lot of false negatives. And uh, it didn't bother him. He said, you know, you were decided to spin this up one more and more and some money. So a year later, we went back, knocked on his door, and he was our first investor. And then Total was funding research on campus also. And then subsequently we got funding. Kosla and then Pritzker, you might not know Karen Pritzker, you may have heard of Hyatt Hotels, and that's the Pritzker family. So it's very unconventional. And then we built a manufacturing facility out in Marlboro, and this is uh, November of 2013. This is Phil Genesee. CEO. He was under Secretary of Energy under Governor Deval Patrick. And a bunch of politicians, David continues to smile. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and th this woman is the commander of the Joint Base Cape Cod, where we'll have the first deployment next year. And this was, uh, we had an event all in manufacturing, too, because we had invented some cool chemistry for lab engineering. No one wanted to help us. I said, you know, people like GE, seen. ABV and it's in you know, all electronics and so on. They just think it's pretty risky. Thanks. So, um, so we hired a fellow that had worked at Ford not to build cars but to build robots to build the cars. And this is a robotic device that builds the, the, the liquid metal cells. Um, yeah, so this is a this shows you. It's very easy to do this uh, virtually. It's so much more difficult to do this. You know? But basically, imagine these things are uh, a four-inch square. Each of them is about 80 uh, amp hours. And that's, that's what we're doing up in Marlboro. We've got to put these together eventually. So this gives you 25 uh, kilowatt hours, which is enough for a single-family home. And then you stack a bunch of these together and you end up with something that is uh, about the size of two megawatt hours, which would 
came about two hundred homes, and so on and so forth. What you need for a, for a subdivision. This is shown in the in the cartoon here next to the solar field, but I'm not sure you put it where the generation is. You put it where the, where the use is, and then where we've got people working on the power electronics as well, and building the boards, designing all that stuff, and uh, so that that would fit on our 53 foot trailer. So it's silent. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. Do you see the, uh, the generator that's at the end of the internet? There's one of the building 18. There's a, there's a generator there. Have you heard it? I've seen it, but have you heard it? I've heard it. It's loud. It's really loud. That's why you can't. You can't imagine they're going to put diesel gensets in Manhattan. You know Manhattan is about to run out of power. Manhattan is the electricity demand keeps going up above the servers. And there's plenty of generation capacity in the New York area, but not on the island. And so right now the transmission lines are near capacity. You can't just keep putting more and more current because, you know, I squared R, eventually you're going to melt the insulation or melt the lines or both. So you say, well, just put in a new line. If you get permitted, it's going to take you 10 years to get permitted. Do you think they're going to go for rolling blackouts in Wall Street? I don't think so. They, they can't put diesel gensets in there. This emission's free. Diesel gensets are filthy. No moving parts. Pumped hydro was the first word. Pumped. The pumps have to be maintained. This is remotely controlled, so it can give you current or it can act as a load. Sometimes to balance the grid, the issue is not we need more current. The issue is we need to dump the current. You know, in places like Western Ontario and West Texas, they actually go into negative pricing. They actually call people up and say, switch on your machinery. We'll pay you to drain current because we've got to balance the grid. Can you imagine you get paid to Charge your battery and you pay to discharge your battery. That's a cool. That's a cool business model. <laughs> so where are we? Well, obviously, the first one's going to be way over here. But our cost models indicate we're probably going to be below five hundred dollars a kilowatt hour at at scale. Not the first. The first one will be quite pretty expensive. So you, your your first deployments are going to be high pain points places like Hawaii, where they're importing diesel. Paying 40 cents a kilowatt hour, and place in Alaska paying a dollar 25 a kilowatt hour. So there, you know, in Alaska, uh, on these microgrids, 70 percent of the time they feather the blades on the land because there's no place to hide. And they've got to keep the supply and demand in check. So, yeah. so the next steps. Uh, we continue to do basic research at MIT, not because I just want to do research, but because we keep in, I thought I invented a battery. It turns out I invented a battery field. And we're continuing to find new alloys and salts. So this is what they put on the cover instead of that beautiful image. Can you believe it? <laughs> <laughs> this is stupid. We had, we had some articles in there about roofs and, and distance learning. Let's say, would you rather have that on the cover or this on the cover? <laughs> I'm not going to ask you. You'll, you'll hurt my feelings. It's <laughs> important to be involved. But anyway, I'm sure you all think this is really, really visually alluring. It's, it's unbelievable. Some, somebody knows somebody. <laughs> <laughs> that can't be on visual appeal. Okay. So. So here's some stuff that's one of my, one of my uh, grad students is working on right now. We've got some new electrolytes that are down around 260. So this is a liquid metal battery. It's a steel clamp, but the can is polymer. So now you have a liquid metal battery with a polymer can. Change, change. 
So let me wrap it up by going back to, to what I've learned that I can share with you. So I call them the heterodox. Not the polyclonies words. So what are the heterodoxies? Well, when I started this, everybody was telling me, well, of course, you have to have low temperature battery. And I, I flew in the face of that. And I said, no, no, we went high temperature batteries because they gave us the immunity to thermal runaway from the high energy density. And scale, like they say, the gigafactory, you're going to build lots of them. And I said, no, 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 no we're going to build fewer. They're going to be bigger. So that, that flew in the face of that idea. And then human resources, they say hire experts. I said, no, 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 you hire novices. They have to be smart, but I want newcomers to the field. And that's the way I've practiced this all along. And we had no battery experts on this. If I had any battery experts on this, on my fear is that we would have been uh, dissuaded from trying the impossible. So, uh, so what, what, what is it that makes these people want to work with me? They have a higher sense of purpose. I mean, they want to, all they want to do is change the world. That's all. They want science and service to society, not science and service to career building. And then I just give them a little bit of uh, instruction and turn them loose, get them in their way. And they're fantastic. The first year was terrible. The first year we had no success because everybody was learning from each other. And after about 15 months, the RPD representative was Dave Danielson, who's now under Secretary of Energy. He came to MIT after the, uh, every three months, and after this one meeting, he stood up and looked at us and he said, I give this project, of all the projects in my portfolio, the lowest chance of success. They went to work, or they looked at each other like, wow. So I got to have the courage to say, no, keep going. We did it. So, Growing up in Canada, I happen to know a little bit of French. And this was this was the battle cry on the barricades in 1968. Be realistic. Ask for the impossible. So that's what I tell my people. And you know, sometimes uh, with enough ingenuity, the impossible becomes the inevitable. That's it. So I think we have time for a few questions. So, so if you have any questions, please raise your hand and like tell us your name and which department you are in. I'll pass the mic over. Hey, thanks, Professor. I'm Cooper Rinsler. I'm in the materials science here. Um, so Amory seems like a special story for a number of reasons, not the least of which is the financing you guys got. Uh, do you think that academia can still be the locus of innovation, given today's fundraising, the funding environment? Yeah, I, I truly believe that uh, um, that the university is the only place left for true innovation. And right now we're going through a, a little bit of a trough because of the uh, congressional sequestration and so on. But um, th there's no other source. When I came here almost 40 years ago, there were big uh, corporate research labs. I mean, the U.S. Steel, there was out here on um, Route 2 just before 128 was the ledge run of labs of Kennecott Copper, uh, big labs for all of chemicals companies, on and on and on. Those things are all gone. They're all gone. They're not innovating. You know, Alcoa, when I went, the first time I went to Alcoa, uh, just outside of Pittsburgh, they had 1,200 people. Now they have fewer than 200. And they're not doing process-related research. They're doing things related to product development and so on. And so um, don't, don't expect any innovation there. National labs, no, forget <laughs> No, national labs, that's, that's those are copy. <laughs> <laughs> you just go 
stuff and just go to a conference. Just go to a conference and look at the stuff. And just go, the only stuff that's got any innovation in it at all is, is the university. And even there, it's really hard because the young people are so worried about making tenure. And so they're, they're following the, the, the paths. You know, like there's, you know, the Hirsch factor to me is, is should be the anti. Uh, see, I, I, I went with the anti expert. So I would go with the anti Hirsch factor. If you got a big Hirsch factor, it must mean that you're you're working with the pack because you quote me and I quote you, and there's a big pack. It's like they're like little kids on a soccer field, you know, twelve kids chasing the ball. You know, and there's there's one kid over here. He's the one that's scoring. But if 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 you got a high Hirsch factor, you must be. They're either really bright or they're really mediocre. I, I can't tell the difference. But if you got a low Hirsch factor, it means you're doing something original and no one's figured out yet. But my colleagues assume that you're an extinct volcano, and therefore you must not be getting quoted because people think that your work is trash. But how do you distinguish? Hirsch factor can't distinguish between the two. So, um, if I were a king for a day, I would I would fund the universities handsomely and without without shackles and not have them. You know, if you got to write an NSF proposal, and instead of just saying, "Well, these are my ideas and this is my work plan," and on top of it, I've got to talk about what is my mentoring program, what is my outreach program, how much cover art do I have on various journals, and on and on and on. What does that have to do with creativity? It has nothing to do with creativity. Nothing. Nothing. But it can prevent me, and Lord help you if you, if you stray outside the boundaries of the margins. You, your your uh, references are not last name, comma, first initial, second initial, comma, if, if you don't follow that format, you're up. It's that simple. So we got to do better than that. Thank you. Maybe, yep. maybe Secretary of uh, Energy. You'll see. <laughs> it's a big change. Josue <laughs> Lopez in electrical engineering. Is on. Uh, so, kind of on that note, uh, how did you first balance? Uh, coming in as a early young professor or a young academic because now having tenure being able to have these bold ideas these visionary ideas uh, And that's the type of work. I want to be able to do but how did you balance that versus Those constraints in terms of getting tenure or just like the things that you have to do before you could get to that place or Do you see anything for a young scientist that wants to continue that the thing that you've been able to do? How do you navigate all of that? so uh, well, what I did, you know, this was this was back in the late '70s and early '80s, so it was a different different era. But um, what I did was, uh, I knew that I had to earn tenure, so I had to play the game. So, first thing is, I I saw that teaching was really really fast in terms of feedback. So. Most of my colleagues blew off their teaching. They, they hunkered down on their research. That was stupid. Because I, I excelled in my teaching, and I immediately got a reputation as being a good teacher. So that all automatically predisposed the, the management thinking, well, we're trying to find justification to keep this guy around, because we're, we're getting clobbered on our teaching, and this guy's, not, this guy's doing really well. So, but I didn't become, um, Obsessive about my teaching, I, I I had to resist because I, I I enjoy it and I could get drawn into perfectionism there. But I made sure that it was good. Most of my colleagues didn't. And then on the on the research side, you know I I, I chose a path. And when I think back on it, there were some some decisions that I took that were pretty risky because I was an experimentalist in the early days getting 
uh, rejected um, proposals and eventually getting funding and then having to establish the lab. And then, of course, being a junior faculty member, uh, students didn't want to work for me. They wanted to work for the big names. And so it was sort of, I was getting students that <clears throat> pardon me, didn't even want to work in my area. They, I knew that they were going to work with me for a year. And as soon as the vacancy opened up, somebody else was going to jump. That's that's just the way it is. But I, I, I managed to I managed to get through that. So um, now you know nowadays it's a little bit better because they have things like seed funding. When I got hired, I was given um, a desk, a chair, and a file cabinet, and I was told uh, not to make long distance calls because <laughs> I didn't have a budget. Better get some research funds in a hurry. I mean, today, you know, we're, we're trying to hire young people and they're negotiating between us and Stanford and whatever else. And they're looking at different startup packages in, in, in fractions of a million dollars. And I just, oh, I just look at it and go, oh, I mean, that's, that's the world we live in. So, you know, take that money and you know, put it on, put it at the right number on the roulette wheel. But that's that's the path for, you know, get you know, build build the reputation, and once you get tenure, then you throw off your you know, throw it off and say, all right, now this is what I really want. To do. You shot me, you got me. This is what I really want to do. But you, you you've got to yeah, you got to play the game. You have to play the game to get there. But it's, you know, it's not, some of it isn't all just a waste of time. You, you've got to go for maximum impact. And that means the right research choices is 